Manufacturing Tech Tips. Today's tech tip is titled, Techniques for More Effective Three-Axis Surface Milling of Molds and Dyes. Demonstration will last approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll open up the chat window for questions and answers. So let's get started. We're going to be talking today generally about three-axis surface machining, uh, perhaps more particularly in terms of hard milling or mold and die milling. Uh, these, these application areas have quite a bit of overlap and, and uh, you know, various uh, options on the theme here. And with our limited time window, we won't be able to exhaustively cover everything about three-axis milling, obviously. But we do want to uh, look at some of the things that do impact our three-axis results in particular things that kind of have a root in the cutting physics. So uh, considerations that we really should keep in mind as we program these these types of motions uh, to, to make the most effective result. Things that we need to consider, uh, the tool loading, the chip load, uh, what we're asking of the tool in terms of uphill and downhill, uh, what sort of what sort of cutting engagements we're asking the tool to perform. Um, we'd like to think about how we best fit our cutting patterns to the geometry that we're working with. Uh, of course, we'd always like to eliminate air cutting when we can. We'd like to use the shortest tools possible. And probably some other things will occur to us as we go through and look at some of these examples. Some particular keys to look for as we go through our demonstration today uh, will be the benefits of Z-level cutting. So in several, in several of our Examples we'll look at approaches where we use a Z-level approach rather than some sort of a raster or scan approach. Uh, there's some good reasons for that, uh, particularly the machines and the controls and the software uh, really do like Z-level motion. Uh, the machines get to basically hold Z still, uh, achieve some rigidity that way. Um, the controller software has an easier time making making arcs, uh, making uh, motion fit uh, for look ahead, that sort of thing. So the controls, the machines themselves, they actually kind of like the Z-level motion. So we'll use some of that when we can. Something else we'll be looking at is, is some ways uh, to really help us fit the tool path to the shape that we're dealing with. And this can be kind of obvious in some cases, and in some cases maybe a little bit less obvious. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll stumble across some things that are a little bit less obvious. And we'll, we'll be looking at uh, several ways to be kind of watching our cutter engagement. Um, obviously, surface finish uh, will depend on how well we do this. Uh, tool life, uh, in some cases, we, we could uh, endanger our, uh, our tools for breaking if, if we don't pay good attention to our, to our chip loads and our cutter engagements. And in some cases, we'll, uh, we'll find it necessary to optimize feed rates afterwards to avoid overloads. So we'll be looking at things like that. With that, we'll go ahead and slide into the demo. Let me share my screen for everyone. So this uh, demo part might look a little bit familiar. This actually goes back several years we've been using this one. And there's some pretty, uh, some pretty nice little features on it that help us show some of these things. Um, I don't have the whole thing cut. I've got some kind of choice operations built on here. Um, just for context, I do have a nice roughing operation with a big tool. We see trochoidal motion in there if we kind of look through the mess. Uh, we also have rest milling operations, which come back with the smaller tool then and, and focus on the, the, the re-roughing or the roughing that wasn't done the first time. We're really not going to spend uh, any time today talking about the roughing operations. Uh, that will be the topic of our next installment. Uh, two weeks from now, we'll have another tech tip where we talk more about roughing techniques and the things that are helpful there. Instead, we're going to look at some of the finishing and semi-finishing operations here. And we'll start just with this simple uh, profile cut around this outside wall. Now, in this case, this is a, a particularly simple way to start. But this profile cut includes a nice little step down 
from one pass to the next that keeps us cutting continuously. In fact, if we, if we verify this and watch the tool run, it would be hard to tell that it's not actually a spiral cut coming down inside. However, if we, if we look at it nice and close, verify, we can see that as we cut the, the regular stripes that we have circle records here. So these are Z-level cuts. Again, the machine likes these kind of cuts. Uh, the, circle, uh, the circle motion fits it very well. It can run very smooth on the control. And then the step downs themselves, these are ramps on the part. And you can see that these are the point motion as we get from one to the other. And this will run quite smoothly. But for the, for the great majority of this motion, uh, we'll be on plane, and the machine will be happy, and the control will be happy, and we'll get some really nice results. <clears throat> Let's just take a look at how we got that for fun. We open up this operation. Uh, we can see that our cutting parameters between levels, we have a ramp on part. Now, as we go through these examples, you'll see again and again how we can basically hover our mouse and really get a good idea of what these different things mean. If you're coming from a different system, maybe some of this terminology is a little bit foreign. Uh, you can always tell what's being asked or what's being uh, su submitted here as information using these these tech tip uh, these little tip graphics. So in this case, we're going to ramp down from one pass to the next right on the part, and that's the way that's done. So pretty easy example for starters. But again, we're, we're introducing the idea that Z-level cutting is advantageous when we can do it, and that we can cut in a continuous method from uh, basically from top to bottom. Let's take a look at another example of that. In this case, we're cutting one of these posts. And here we get a little bit better look at it. You can see that on the top pass, we're getting a full cut all the way around, nothing left behind. And then for each step down pass as we go, uh, the step downs are actually spaced out in the same way that the cutting paths, uh, the, cu the cutting levels themselves are. So we get a real nice consistent um, remainder of material here. The cusps will be very nice and consistent all the way down. And if we'd like to make that look even more like like a true spiral, simply come in here and decrease our ramp angle. Five is already pretty small, but if we take this down to, say, uh, two degrees, you can see just how nice and smooth we go from one level to the next. And if we watched that spin around, it would look extremely smooth. So that's some good examples of Z-level cutting and, and the advantages we find there. Let's take a look at this little center divot here. So in this case, we can see uh, this, this nice little circle. Uh, should be nice and easy to put a, a pattern into. But because we start from the top lip, and then we have that steep little wall, and we drop down to the floor and walk to the inside here, uh, there's going to be a condition as we come down this wall where we're engaging material more heavily than in any other part of this, of this pattern. So we'd really like to think about a way to keep that material engagement more consistent. So let's take a look at this operation, see what we can do with it. In the cutting method for area mill, we have an opportunity not only to select the pattern, follow periphery, uh, inward versus outward. We can also say, how is that step over applied? So step over can be applied on plane or alternatively on part, which means that step overs themselves will be spaced evenly, not from a planar view, but from uh, basically the, the surface itself as you walk along it. Passes will be more 
consistent. So let's see what that effect has. It takes a little bit longer to process a cut this way. The math's a little tougher. But you can see in the end that we have a really nice, evenly spaced result from the top lip down the steep wall into the floor and across. So as we then step down from that lip into the floor zone, we would see uh, a nice consistent chip load and uh, a nice side cutting effect from there on into the center. So this is a nice result right here. And making that small change, it's a small change and you know from the from kind of the high level view, it, it's very little difference. But when we think about the cut itself and how, how we're asking that cutter to engage material, you can see that some of these options can really be beneficial. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at another another approach to cutting something like this. In this case, we're going to we're going to achieve uh, a true spiral, a true spiral from outside to in. If you if you see that that uh, pattern closely, you can see that we start at the outside, make one full pass all the way around. You can see here that the first pass. Uh, is close to the spiral and over here it's further away. So you can see the first pass goes all the way around without coming in. And as soon as it comes back to the start point, it starts to spiral in all the way to the center. We do this with a streamline operation and these, uh, these true spirals can then be achieved by specifying the, uh, the rails themselves. So in the drive method for streamline, We can specify these flow curves and additionally cross curves. In this case, we have no cross curves. What I'm going to do is go ahead and delete these flow curves so you can see how I delete, how I uh, selected them. And we'll go ahead and select the first curve. We'll just grab this guy here to be our first curve. And then we'll add a second one. And the second flow cut here, the second flow curve, I should say, will be uh, the point right here in the center of the part. So this is a a revolved part, at least in part, so that center point is available to us and as soon as we grab it, <clears throat> we can then make sure that our cut pattern is not zigzag or, or uh, something like that, but rather helical. We'll grab that and we'll come up with that, with that spiral cut. You can kind of see it assemble there. So again, another technique for cutting smoothly and continuously as well as fitting the shape uh, to the surfaces themselves. That, that streamline operation uh, will, will make a similar spiral from outside to inside even if we start with something that's not circular and it will morph, it, morph its shape as it goes. Uh, another nice way to fit, fit toolpath to the shape. Okay, moving right along, let's look at another example of Z-Level. So without getting too hung up on what this, this particular toolpath looks like, you can see the, uh, the shape of these, of these spoke uh, fillers here in the, in, the, in the die. They have a steep backside, they have kind of a shallow spot in the front, um, all kinds of, of variations in steepness and, and, uh, and really direction that they run. What we're going to try to do here is go back to that Z-level approach and see how much of this we can do with Z-level. Obviously, we have some areas that are steeper. Uh, they should be well suited to this and some areas that are shallower and may give us a little bit more trouble. And this is the result we have. Um, nice, even cuts on the steep walls. And as we move from the steep back onto this flat plane, you can see that our cuts are spacing out further and further and probably not giving us the kind of result we want out here in this in this flatter area. So one way to solve that would be to, uh, to to build some depth zones in here where we can tighten up our step overs and put more cuts in here. However, if we do that out on the side where it's steep, we'll really just be burning up the tool and we won't like that result very much. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll suffer a little bit of surface quality problems and perhaps some tool life problems by doing that. What we'll do instead is use a nice little 
option in here called Cut Between Levels. Hopefully most of you have seen this. If you haven't, uh, this is one to really remember. By using Cut Between Levels, we can invoke a combination style of pattern where we'll have uh, Z-level cuts in steep areas and where those, where those uh, passes become wider apart, as we just saw, will backfill in with uh, essentially uh, projected patterns. So just by toggling on that one option, we can now see So you can see up here, this is all pure Z level, and as the Z level strokes start to separate out in distance, it's being filled in with these projected offset patterns in between the Z level strokes. So this is a, a very, very helpful technique for producing a very even um, re remainder of material, uh, great for semi-finishing. So we can, we can take an approach like this on a semi-finished cut and ensure that the material that's left for our finishing tool is, is very consistent and very predictable. And will give us the best chance of, of making a really nice finish on our, on our finished passes. Okay. Now, supposing we don't want to take that sort of combination approach uh, for our finish cuts because we'd like to get our finish passes uh, really as, as nicely tailored to the surfaces as we can, let's look at a couple, uh, a couple other options here for how we might do that. In this case, we have a circular part, so we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll really be doing well if we can line these, these strokes up as a circle, which is, in fact, what I've accomplished here. And we did that. by specifying the cut pattern as concentric. And if I just let that be automatic, we can, we can have a quick look here and see what that looks like. So you see the pattern that it has in mind. It's going to be true circles. And again, that's a good way to get really, really consistent stepovers. So a, a concentric pattern um, would help us in terms of uh, consistency of stepovers in, in probably lots of different situations. But in this case, because my part is also circular, uh, I can specify for myself the pattern center as the center of the part. And now when I look at the pattern I'm getting, you can see that it lines up beautifully with these revolved surfaces, which is just what I want. All right, the last one I want to show you here is in the bottom. So we've just used a uh, an offset pattern coming coming from the outside in, uh, collapsing away from the boundaries. And you can see that this is a pretty nice result. There, that looks better. Uh, but let's see if we can't improve it a little bit. This is going to work well. However, uh, it would be nice if we could get our machine's uh, high-speed functions to work a little better uh, and get away from some of these sharp corners. So let's open this up. And in the cutting parameters here, we can see that there is uh, an opportunity to look at the corners. And we would like for the path shape in the corners, instead of being sharp, to be smooth. So now we can see that the stepovers themselves uh, will smooth out, and the corners will smooth out as well. And we can ask for that. So our, our radius is still quite small. It's half a millimeter. Uh, but even half a millimeter can make quite a difference in terms of how the machine runs and uh, how quickly we cut.
just a minute to recalculate this one. And now if we take a look, our corners have been smoothed off, our stepovers have been smoothed off, but we have suffered a, uh, a setback here. The, the final passes around these vertical bosses have been interrupted, which really isn't ideal. We, we'd like not to have this little interruption in that pass. So let's go back and ask for in our drive method specification under this more section, we can ask for a finish pass, which means make sure that we take a full pass around anything that is a boundary, essentially. And let's see if we don't solve that problem. So now we still have our, our rounded corners. This is going to help us quite a bit. We have our rounded step overs. That'll be nice. And we additionally have the full pass taken all the way around our boundary elements. So this is uh, really just what we're looking for. Uh, the other thing that, that we can uh, mention just briefly here is that in terms of our machine controls themselves, there are options available in the machine controls for how to, how to handle look aheads, how to turn on and off various uh, high-speed functions that may be available depending on the control manufacturer and the age of the control and the way it was fit to the machine. These things are very unique uh, per, you know, per machine situation, but we have an opportunity here under machine control to create start of path events, end of path events that we can, uh, we can specify M codes in here or, or even special, specialized codes that we can pass on to the post-processor and invoke a particular uh, mode of high-speed look-ahead on the machine as well. So that's something else to keep in mind. All right, so those are all the patterns I wanted to show you. I did want to circle back, though, on a couple of things. Um, first of all, let's take a look back at this post that we made. <clears throat> and if we post, if we verify this guy and take a look at the tool we're using, we might suspect right away that we're going to have some interference with this and sure enough as we as we march it down we can see that we've got we've got interference problems so uh, we'd like to use the shortest tools we can that's that's generally true almost almost always the case <clears throat> however uh, we can't always use the shortest tool because we'll have holder interferences and other problems so let's take a look at how we can solve that This operation was created from top to bottom without, uh, without collision checking turned on. Obviously, that's the way we got the result from top to bottom. Um, in this small case, that might not have been very clever because it's pretty small, but on a very large die, uh, the collision checking does consume some extra time, it takes longer to calculate, and on a very large die, it could be, it could be significant. So uh, asking for all of the toolpath to be done without collision checking lets us take this approach instead. So after it's all finished, we can come in here and basically divide by holder. And when we divide by holder, we can divide by transfer. So if there were if there were entries and exits, if there were non-cutting moves on this on this toolpath, every non-cutting move would be an opportunity then for the toolpath to be divided. Uh, but remember how clever we were, we, we used the, the ramp on part step down there are no non-cutting moves from the top of this cut all the way to the bottom. So instead we're going to ask for it to divide by collision. It's going to wait for the holder to collide and then divide this thing for us. And we'll go ahead and ask for that to happen. And you can see that it's showed up in two pieces now. And it's easy enough then take a look at the different tools we have. Oh, I have a long version of that 10 millimeter ball, so I can take the second of these operations, the second half of this, and just drop it onto that longer tool. Now you see we have two of these. Let's 
top half and the bottom half. And if we verify the bottom half, you can see that my longer tool will have no problems whatsoever reaching all the way to the bottom of this. And everything's happy. So in order to get that, uh, that opportunity to divide by holder in terms of the, the holder collision itself rather than just the non-cutting moves, that's actually an option that's been in preview mode for a couple of releases and uh, soon to be out in, in release mode. Um, if, you, if you'd like to pursue that, uh, that opportunity to divide by collision, that second choice on that dialog is available. Um, you give GTAC a call and they'll explain to you how to do that and give you, give you all the caveats that come with it as a, as a pre-release thing. But a nice, a nice technique to use. The last thing I'd like to do, uh, just before we call it quits here, is return back to this operation. Now you remember how we started this. Uh, we used just a regular Z level. We did cut between levels. And we had that result where uh, some areas of this of this group of surfaces was cut very cleanly, uh, nice fine step overs on the vertical areas, and then some of it was uh, much more uh, spread out and, and really not quite what we were looking for. Uh, this kind of thing can also be revealed to us, not just by eye, but if we, uh, if we go ahead and look at the contours of this. So if we look at the work piece of this operation, so we'll calculate all the way, all the operations up to this point, take a look at the workpiece here, and show the thickness by color. This is going to give us an interesting view of what we've done so far up to this point. Let's take just a moment. It has to go back and think about all the in-process workpiece models from the start of this setup to, uh, to the current position. And it's going to show us that in-process state and also indicate to us how deep all the remaining material is everywhere on the part. I think we can guess what this will look like. Uh, we'll have a nice close, uh, nice close cut on the sides of this and we'll see as we go from the steep section to the flatter section how the remaining material increases in height. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, the colors on this are, are a little bit uh, fun to look at. Um, as it turns out, we've got some, uh, some interesting improvements to how this displays for you coming up. Uh, I'll, I'll let Mark tell you all, all about that at uh, PLM World. But um, the key point here is to, is to understand what we're looking at in terms of uh, what material is left. So in some cases, you know, we can do something more clever and, and, and really fix this problem before we have to deal with it. But every now and then you find yourself in a position where you've, you've run your cutter through various depths of material and really the thing that you want to do is, is optimize its feed rate so that you maintain uh, chip load as you go. Um, so feed rate optimization is, is kind of the last refuge of the scoundrel here. We're going to we're going to go ahead and take a look at how that is done as well. So knowing what this looks like, let's come back here and ask for our toolpath now to <clears throat> optimize its feed rate. And it's just as simple as coming here to the finished toolpath and asking it to be optimized. The trick here is understanding what, what these uh, what these values are looking for. The nominal step over and the nominal depth of cut then describe what your expected cutting condition is. When, when you set the feed rate for this operation, you thought this is essentially what it would be doing, right? It's going to be stepping over at about two millimeters at a time and maybe taking one millimeter uh, depth of cut as it goes. So from that nominal condition then, we can ask for uh, various feed rates to come of that. Material gets thicker, we can reduce that percent of feed rate all the way down to 10% of the of the nominal feed rate, the specified feed rate, uh, which would be quite a bit slower. And uh, we can even 
ask for it to speed up in areas where it's thin, where the material rain, remaining material is thin. So uh, we have specified here as low as 10% and as much as 2x or 200% of the programmed feed rate as we get into material that's either thicker than or thinner than our nominally expected material of two millimeter step over and one millimeter depth. <clears throat> and this length interval says that we'll be looking at the, the cutting conditions every 10 millimeters and that's how we'll come up with this. So simply by asking it to do that optimization, now when we verify this operation, we can kind of step through here. You see that the feed rate is indicated. That's the rapid feed rate up top. And as we step in and start cutting, um, our nominal feed rate was 250, which is the very first approach it makes. And as soon as it gets into material, it starts slowing down a little bit and speeding up a little bit, depending on where it is. So it goes up to as high as 500 feed rate for the areas where the, the material is very thin and it's it, we, we've told it it's able to go up to 2x. So that's what it's doing. And then we see as we walk down this face that now we're under 250. The material is getting thicker. Walk further down the face. Now we're down to uh, that's the side. Let's go into the middle here. Uh, further now we're down to 130 feed rate. And as we get all the way out here to the to the thickest condition, uh, we're all the way down to 43. So we've come almost all the way down to our minimum 10% feed rate as that remaining material gets thicker. So the resulting uh, the resulting motion then is much more sensitive to the actual cutting conditions. Uh, we're able to calculate that because we're looking at that in-process workpiece that's carried over from operation to operation. We can do this for each operation as required. Uh, like I said, in, in most cases we find uh, find ways to, to equalize these cuts and, and make them more consistent than this. But in cases where we find ourselves in various cut depths, we can always come to the feed rate optimization and make sure that our, uh, our chip load stays as consistent as possible. All right, so I believe that brings me to the end of my prepared material. Uh, we're going to call this the end of the demo.